This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We end the show with the news out of Virginia, where avowed neo-Nazi James Alex Fields pleaded guilty Wednesday to 29 counts of hate crimes in a federal court for plowing his car into a crowd of anti-racist protesters in Charlottesville in August 2017. As part of the deal, prosecutors agreed not to seek the death penalty. Last December, a Virginia jury sentenced Fields to life in prison for his violent act, which killed anti-fascist protester Heather Heyer and injured 28 others at a counter-protest of the white supremacist Unite the Right rally. We turn now to a new book that addresses the tragic events in Charlottesville, as well as the rising number of race-based mass shootings, hate crimes, police shootings of unarmed men in the past several years. It also looks at cases of discrimination against African Americans for simply sitting in coffee shops or trying to vacation at Airbnb-hosted homes biased, uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think and do, examines how implicit bias impacts everything from hate crimes to microaggressions in the workplace, school and community, and what we can do about it. The book's author, Professor Jennifer Eberhardt, writes, quote, "...in Charlottesville, bias ripped through the pact we've made to pretend that blatant bigotry is a relic of the past. In truth, bias has been biding its time in an implicit world, in a place where we need not acknowledge it to ourselves or to others, even as it touches our soul and drives our behavior. We're joined right now by Jennifer Eberhardt, professor of psychology at Stanford University, recipient of the 2014 MacArthur, MacArthur Genius Grant. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Professor. It's great to have you with us. Congratulations on the release of your book this week. Brian Stevenson, who um, was the who spearheaded the Legacy Museum, yes. where we just went in Montgomery, yeah. Alabama, uh, calls your book groundbreaking. You know, the subtitle of Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice That Shapes What We See, Think and Do, is hardly uh, relates to Charlottesville in the sense that hidden prejudice was right. not the issue there. That's but right. But connect the two. Talk about what you thought as you watched what unfolded at the University of Virginia. Well, I mean, so this uh, Unite the Right rally was the largest public gathering of white supremacists in a generation. Um, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. They were there to uh, protest the um, removal of a statue of, of Robert E. Lee from, um, you know, the core of the city. and. Uh, it's, it's, you know, so they, they were there to start a race war, um, according to them. And uh, there were uh, count, counter protesters there who uh, showed up to uh, try to protect the city and protect their values. Um, and uh, lots of, of clashes uh, during that, that uh, rally. And a lot of um, uh, just. Uh, I think concern about the role of the police uh, with that and just not uh, standing back and not intervening as people were being uh, beaten and um, taunted and, and so forth. And uh, it um, kind of, I don't know, led to a lot of people in the city of Charlottesville and on the UVA campus to um, you know, sort of think about uh, how this happened and, and why it happened and why was this, you know, the um, sort of ground zero for for that movement. And so, how does that tie in such explicit manifest uh, racism with your idea of uh, unconscious, implicit bias? Well, I think it ties in if we, um, as I think, a, well, a couple things. Uh, I think people think a lot about, um, you know, sort of bigotry uh, rising up uh, when we have economic insecurity or instability. Um, but there's uh, research showing that it's, it's not just that, it's also the changing racial demographics uh, in this country, and that makes people fearful, that makes them nervous. Uh, there's research by uh, Jennifer Richardson and Maureen Craig showing uh, that just reminding um, white Americans of uh, that changing racial dynamic or the changing uh, racial landscape can lead them to, um, you know, express more prejudice against uh, people of color, to feel like uh, discrimination against, against whites uh, is on the rise, and that's the, the big problem. 
problem and to also um, endorse more politically conservative views and, and policies. So, um, so it's not just the economic issue why we get um, this uh, move towards more explicit uh, bias or old-fashioned racism. It's, it's also this concern about, like, losing uh, your presence and your status uh, in society. Now, <clears throat> President Trump did not tweet about uh, Fields yesterday um, pleading guilty to a hate crime. But this morning, he did tweet. Um, he tweeted, FBI and DOJ to review the outrageous Jesse Smollett case in Chicago. Hmm. It is an embarrassment to our nation. Um, this has captured the media over the last few days, right. uh, the Chicago um, prosecutors dropping the 16 felony charges against Jesse Smollett for uh, arranging a hate crime against him. That's what they charged him with. Yes. Uh, he did some community service, uh, forfeited his $10,000 bond, um, and they've dropped all the charges. So Trump tweeted about this, right. but on this issue of the white supremacist killer, um, he didn't say a word. Can you m make a segue from one to the other and what your thoughts are on Smollett? Right. So, um, you know, as a social scientist, I'm not, <laughs> you know, uh, looking at an isolated case and sort of trying to make claims about that one way or the other. Um, I think that case is still unfolding, too, and so I'm not sure, you know, how all of that will end up. But what I could say um, is that we know um, that— um, you know, our um, leadership matters in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, people's uh, willingness to express uh, a bias. Um, I think also the social norms uh, matter. There's a lot of research on that, actually. So when social norms shift um, so that we're becoming um, sort of less egalitarian, um, that uh, leads um, you know, sort of individuals, that gives them license to express ex express more bias. And so it's not just about a, a choice that we're making as individuals to, um, you know, to be biased or not. Uh, it's, it's also about the um, social climate. Um, we're, we're social beings, and so we're um, sensitive to what the social climate is. And to the extent that the social climate is moving away from uh, being egalitarian, that can feed our, our bias. That can—and that that can lead implicit biases actually to become explicit, um, because there is um, a context for that. There's a way in which that's welcomed. Um, and so uh, that um, those social norms can lead us to actually become more prejudiced and to act on those prejudices. Well, can you explain what goes into constituting an implicit bias? So, implicit bias can be defined as the beliefs and the feelings that we have about social groups that can influence our uh, decision-making and our actions, even when we're unaware of it. And so, the—you the, know, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, biases that exist despite uh, how we see ourselves as egalitarian, say, or uh, biases that uh, can exist despite our intentions and our motivations to, um, you know, to, to act otherwise. You begin your book, Biased, with the story of your five-year-old son. Yes. Tell us about what happened. So, so yes, yeah, so we were on a plane uh, together, and, you know, he's five, and so he's looking around and just really excited about being on an airplane with mom, and so he's checking everybody out, and he sees this guy, and he says, hey, that guy looks like daddy. And, you know, and I look at the guy, first of all, he doesn't look anything at all like daddy, and it turns out <laughs> that he was the only black guy on the plane. And so I'm thinking, okay, you know, my son obviously thinks that all black people look alike, right? So I'm going to try to have a conversation with him about that. But before I could have that conversation, um, he uh, looks up at me and he says, I hope he doesn't rob the plane. And I said, what? You know, what did you say? And he said it again. Well, I hope he doesn't rob the plane. And I said, Everett, you know, why would you say that? And you know, daddy wouldn't rob a plane. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know. And I said, well, why would you say that? And he looked at me with this really sad face. And he said, I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I was thinking that. You later talk about your son being a target of racial bias. Yeah. I do. I mean, so that son, the five-year-old, is now um, 17. And uh, so he's growing into, you know, a man, a, a, a young man. And um, so 
you know, people sort of experience, you know, him with the same, you know, kind of uh, sort of, you know, they, they, they uh, his presence triggers those same kinds of thoughts. And uh, he's becoming aware of that over time and aware that he could be seen as a threat in, in the eyes of others. Well, is there any way to overcome implicit bias? Well, you know, um, it's not something that we can just overcome and get rid of, uh, you know, completely. And that's something that I write about um, in the in the book, Bias, that um, I think we keep thinking we'll get to the day where we'll be done with this, we don't have to worry about it. And, and the fact is, is that we have to be uh, sort of constantly vigilant around it. So even when we can, you know, we, we can push it down and with our laws and we can push it down with our social norms and we can be motivated, right, to, to work on it. It's it's not it's, it's something that we have to be vigilant about all the time because it could spring up again. The social conditions can um, you know uh, allow it to, to to surface again. So there's so, some situations that um, really um, sort of promote uh, bias more than others. And as social scientists, we know a lot about those situations. Um, so the, to the extent that we can manage those situations, uh, you know, we, we can the better basically. Mm -hmm. I don't need you to tell me who you're going to vote for in 2020. <laughs> okay. But I do want to ask you to comment on the B-boys. That's Bernie, Biden, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, um, and Beto. Okay, that, they're called the B-boys. Okay. They're all white all right. uh, men. Uh, there are a number of people of color and women who are running for president. But mm -hmm. they are getting much more attention, these four white men. Your thoughts? What does the media need to learn? We have 30 seconds. Well, I, I, mean, I think um, maybe, um, you know, we can have a discussion uh, about, um, you know, who people think of as, as leaders, right? Um, sort of who do we associate with leaders? And um, leadership tends to be associated with men, um, and leadership uh, tends to be uh, associated with people who are uh, white and, and powerful. And so, um, to the extent that you have an inconsistency there between what a person looks like and what social group they belong to and what they're trying to do, that, that's hard for our, you know, for us to wrap our minds around. Well, we're going to leave it there, but we're going to do part two and put online at democracynow.org. Jennifer Eberhardt, professor of psychology at Stanford University, author of the new book, Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice That Shapes That We See, Think, and Do.